Spirit this morning, I asked my brother to remind me when I began, and the word is universal, that the event of the cross, though it took place in time and history in a particular locality, cannot be confined to that. The, the nature of the event is so great that it is intended for universal reality, universal expression, universal benefit. But of necessity, it can't take place universally in every place and at one time. It takes place historically in the moment of God in the place chosen, the least of places. Outside of Jerusalem and out the dung heap, outside the camp, in a uh, despised nation. But its intention is universal. And I don't believe that that universality has yet been established. I don't believe that that event has had its widest amplification over the breadth of this globe. Somehow, ironically, it has been contracted and uh, only upheld by a small, relatively small uh, audience. So there's a greater and larger world that has not yet been affected by and probably does not even know or understand this event that has taken place. And yet it's incumbent upon all men everywhere to know of it, to receive its benefit or to refuse it. So if that's true, it f it gives to God a problem of how before the age concludes in judgment can all the world have opportunity to consider the event of Christ crucified. Can he have his son pass through a second time and give a reenactment of the first crucifixion who is already now enthroned in heaven? And so I believe, and I'm rare in this, that Israel called to be the witness nation, is intended as the vehicle to provide that reenactment and essence of the suffering through which its own Messiah and Lord has passed, so that the universality of its message can be broadcast, not by speaking, but by demonstration. And at the same time, they themselves will be healed and uh, saved by the very thing through which they're passing. It's like uh, something of multi uh, levels taking place all at one time. And as I hinted last night, the judgment of Israel, and that's what the cross is, is a judgment. The wrath of God fell on Jesus that was intended for us. It was devastating, as we know. And what he had to bear physically and in the agony of his soul. If you'll remind me, there's a remarkable selection this morning from Spurgeon on the one statement, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? As being the epicenter of the Lord's suffering at the cross. This was the midnight of his moral anguish, is the awareness that the Father had to turn his face from him. And isn't it remarkable that this is in measure what Israel itself will experience. They will feel God forsaken. That's why in some place in Isaiah, in that selection of chapters, it says, you're inscribed in my hands. And um, don't feel like, uh, like an abandoned daughter but you have always been foremost in my consciousness. But Zion is going to say, God has forsaken us. So there's a necessity for Israel in some measure to experience the deep pangs, the moral anguish, as well as the physical suffering through which the Lord himself has previously passed. And as I hope to show you this morning from the great text of Isaiah 53, that in the experience, if you'll excuse my language, and the mutuality of their sufferings, they will recognize His. There's something about the nature of suffering that reveals. Have you noticed? 
<laughs> that somehow if we're all hale and haughty and everything is uh, just coming up roses, we are somehow kept from reality. And we are only too eager to clutch those flesh comforting things. But when we're sick, when we're despairing, when we're broken, when circumstances of a kind have done us in, it opens a portal to the reality that is reality that is otherwise disguised by the blandishments and the amenities that the world is, is very happy to provide so long as it keeps you in a false reality. The true reality is hidden and there's a remarkable way in which suffering reveals it. So, if Israel is to fulfill its destiny, and this has got to be foremost in the consideration of the church, that God has given a call that you are to be a nation of priests and a light unto the world. And Paul says in Romans, the gift and callings of God are irrevocable. Once God has made them, he's obliged to fulfill them, or how is he God? If Israel does not come into her destiny, God is nullified as God. He has put all his eggs in one basket. The fulfillment of his word, where it would be least expected by a nation who doesn't give a rap for that fulfillment in their present apostasy and unbelief and hardness against God, and yet God must fulfill it. It's as if he has stacked all the cards against him so that he will be all the more glorified eternally when there shall be this fulfillment because he has spoken. And what is the church, among other things? It's that strange amalgam of people who are not bearing the world's credentials and are scorned by it, but who are jealous for the honor and the glory of their God and recognize that if his word is not fulfilled and he is compromised and contradicted by his own failure, the, the issue would be unspeakably tragic for all of the e eternal future, all, uh, all the future if God is not God. He has got to come through with a people who don't even, even know their calling, let alone have even the slightest disposition to fulfill it. Because if we took a, a uh, survey today of present-day Israel, their deepest ambition is to be the Hong Kong of the Middle East, to be a financial success, to establish their own little civilization without God. They want to flourish. They want to succeed, but they have no God consciousness except for that small orthodox minority, and even there, their intention and thoughts are gobbled and perverse in many ways. So we have, we have to understand the magnitude of what yet must be completed that concludes this age. Israel's redemption, the fulfillment of its calling, a nation of priests and a light unto the world. And so I often say, increasingly in these days, standing before different audiences in different parts of the world, in Africa where I will soon again be, that if you see me, you have a foretaste of God's millennial glory. Here's a piece of Israel, redeemed and restored, and serving in the capacity for which we were intended as a light, and you know that you're receiving a light of a very special kind. It's not that uh, we're boasting in ourselves, but it's our calling. We, we have come into our own, and um, God has given a certain capacity to express his mysteries by that priestly people, when in fact they become priestly and to be able to communicate the mysteries of God, the nature of God, in those places in the earth that have been antagonistic against him, and where Israel itself has suffered at their hands. So can you imagine messengers going forth out of the redeemed nation 
into Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Pakistan, those centers of terrorist activity that now delight in Jewish blood and will succeed in taking it. And that to go back into those same nations and speak to them the counsel of God and the wisdom of the Most High, but not in some berating way, which I, in my earliest service, occasionally uh, indulged. That I had a little secret delight in zapping the goyim, the Gentiles. Yes, I was speaking the truth, but I, I gave it a little extra twist because there was something yet resident in my Jewish soul that was historic in its origin in which I'm paying you back for what we have received uh, over the millennia. But the Lord has dealt with me, sanctified the vessel, met and, un and revealed this lingering thing to purge and to, because a priest has got to be free of any taint and of any use of his priesthood in order to redound unto himself a benefit in any way. His, his, God, his service has got to be the most impersonal. That's not to say detached and antiseptic and, and uh, indifferent, but there must not be any quotient of return unto himself or it's no longer priestly. Imagine a nation like that. How shall I say it? Without sounding so vain as a, a nation of art cats is, you know, and I'm not the perfect statement, but it's better than no statement. <laughs> it's a little foretaste of a, a, a sign of God's intention for an entire people. Interesting that my name Katz actually means priest. One of those happenstance things from both father and mother because Katz is a contraction of two Hebrew words. Though the word Katz in German means cat, but in Hebrew it's Kohan Sadek. The K-A is from Kohan, which means priest. If you know a Jew by the name of Kohen or Khan, that's the derivative and for the Hebrew word, and tzaddik is righteous, priest of righteousness. So, I know there's a great Melchizedek priesthood that even eclipses the Aaronic. So from both ends, I seem to be fortunate to have inherited such a name, a title, a calling, and I believe functioning in it by the grace of God. And not the least of the reason is to whet the appetite of the church that they should appreciate the mystery and know that what they're receiving in only a small measure is an, an index of the greater blessedness that God intends for all mankind through that one people whom he has chosen. Because as we shared this morning in the prayer time, I will choose whom I will choose. I will elect whom I will elect. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And how is that chosenness of God more revealed than when he will choose not the most conspicuous, the most gifted, the most promising, who seem to have the credentials, but the least, the most rebellious, the most apostate, the most difficult, the most horrible in their historic apostasies and idolatries, that's the people he's chosen. And to redeem them and bring them into the gifts and callings of God that are without repentance, that are irrevocable, is an ultimate statement of God himself, both in the uniqueness of his choosing, because he'll always choose what is least, that he might be most distinguished in the success through it. And so we have the revelation both of his wisdom, his nature, and also his power to succeed in such an undertaking as this. That will be the basis for the everlasting tribute, acknowledgement, and praise of God from shore to shore, from one end of the earth to the other, throughout all generations. So great is the accomplishment of God's redemptive purpose in the earth. And what's his instrument? How, how I have despaired. <laughs> the church. The church is the chosen agency. Gentiles are going to be the instrument of Israel's restoration many of whom have no stomach for it, 
and left to themselves would just as soon that the dry bones remain dry. Because so long as they are dry, then they, as the church, remain and obtain the singular um, blessedness of God. They are the people of God. And why share the glory with, with a bunch of dum-dums who have had their chance and lost it? That's why the, the older brother of the prodigal son could not enter the feast. He couldn't understand why the father was so rapturous for the return of a profligate son who had expended all of his substance on whores and eaten the, the, the husks with the pigs, that the father should run to meet him and kiss him and give him a garment and a ring and make a feast for him. And there's the older son outside moping. You never made a feast for me, and I've always been faithful. And blah, 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 blah. You know that dutiful Christian? He said, your brother who is lost has been found. He who is dead is alive. You should rejoice. But there's something of a rivalry, competition. The son, the older son wants to bask uniquely alone in the father's favor and does not want to share it with someone who patently does not deserve it. You've got to dwell on that story because it's the issue of the church. Will the church, who has been faithful in a dutiful way, all through these generations, actually be willing to see the return of the prodigal and then have the glory in which it alone basks shared when it wants to be the foremost consideration of the Father? We'd be fools not to consider what lurks in our deeps. Because when you shall be called upon prophetically, corporately, to address the dry bones that they might live, you'll be faced with this issue. If you don't prophesy, they remain dead. But your prophecy has got to be more than just a mechanical gesture. It's got to be a desire to see those bones alive, to share the glory, to be magnanimous and, and rejoice for the return of the prodigal. And, you know, and to know that you know there's enough glory to go around for both. Right? And you desire, and that your faith is more than just a mechanical uh, factor. It's a live faith that desires to see their restoration, or else your word will fall to the ground. Merely to prophesy dutifully is to fail. Merely to meet the Jews in the wilderness of the nation and give them an overt, uh, what's the word, minimal accommodation is to fail. God says, I will meet with you speaking to them in the wilderness of the nations face to face. They have got to see more than just Christian obligation. They've got to see the face of God, which ran to, met, to meet the son and to kiss him before he even arrived. And that from Gentiles? Lord, my faith staggers. <laughs> Can you perform that? That's as much a miracle as Israel's restoration itself. It requires as much resurrection power to bring Gentiles from their present mentality and disposition to that kind of prophetic <laughs> reality so akin to God that God says it's my very face from where they presently are. And what's the medium by which all of this is to be accomplished and upon which it rests? The Word of God, spoken. So someone has rightly said, every true preaching is a bringing of the hearers to death and a raising of them again. <laughs> And I've seen God succeed in this under hopeless situations 
talk about motley assemblages where as you scan the faces, you, you despair. There doesn't seem to be any evidence that there's any possibility of fulfillment. But before those days are over, the faces have changed. Or is it I who have, am perceiving them? We've changed together. And I see the resurrection through the word actually taking place. People being raised up out of their graves of religious convention and into a new place of prophetic and apostolic understanding and commitment. It's a great drama, saints, a great saga. And so I berated an African congregation in Kenya on my last visit, arriving in short pants. I thought that the meeting was that evening, but no, it was that afternoon. In fact, the saints, were, the, the church was already assembled, expecting us to come in. And there I'm in my short pants. Well, you don't dare appear. A minister in short pants. So I had one of the other brothers share, and I sat in the back of the room, but I could hear and see it was not the Lord's fulfillment. I had to get up, stand in front of them and say, do you believe that God can anoint a man in short pants? <laughs> see what God was, was testing and, and challenging was their religious... Uh, What's the word? Their false propriety of what is appropriate. Well, the Lord anointed the man in short pants. And the reason I remember this comes up now over the word great. I'm appealing to you to understand the greatness of our call. In the, in the conclusion of the age, in this drama, this redemptive drama of God, which God knew from the beginning, even before it commenced, it was already known of him and determined by him to make his son a lamb slain from before the foundations of the world and that it would have this consequence and be the polar event that concludes the age and returns Israel through a church that has itself appropriated the cross and its power. It's great. And so I sensed in these Africans a lackluster attitude. They had no vision. They were content for Christianity being a succession of services. Because outside the building, what is there to hope for in a poverty-stricken Africa? And so I said to them, someone was sent to tell Saul, who had seen the vision of the resurrected Christ, and was blinded and lay like a dead man for three days, neither eating or drinking, tell him what great things he must suffer for my namesake. And I said to the church, we are called to great things. God wants to lift you out of a cesspool of despondency and limitation. He's, we're called to greatness, to great things. And so that's what is being put before us in these days. In Isaiah 40-something or other, in the 40s, Maybe someone can help me. It says, uh, my salvation shall be known, something like that, throughout all the world. My arm.
somebody can look through their concordance the word om. Yeah, it's there, but there's a there's a reference in the 40s, and in somewhere in the Isaiah 40 something. Where the arm of the Lord shall be revealed. It is in 52, but there's another place. 40 verse 5. I'm sorry? 40 verse 5. 40 verse 5. five. Yes, that's it. Mark that verse. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. If that is the word of God, we need to ask as careful students exegeting the scripture, when has that been fulfilled? Has it yet been fulfilled? Must it yet be fulfilled if God has spoken it? All flesh shall see it together. It is very much in keeping with Isaiah 52 that was introduced last evening, but needs again now to be considered. In the 15th verse, so shall he sprinkle many nations. The king shall shut their mouths at him, for that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. I'm saying... And I'm not saying, thus saith the Lord, this, my, my perspective is the absolute dictum that this is the word of God, this is the way in which this must be seen and understood. But I am saying, this is the way that I see it, and I understand it, and I'm offering it to you for your consideration as more than an opinion. That whatever, to whatever degree I have a prophetic call, which no man can take for himself, except it be given, and I'm seeing through the eyes appropriate to that calling, I see these scriptures as not yet fulfilled, but future. All flesh must see it together. That which men had heard and had not seen has yet to come to them. They've yet to be sprinkled. The blood has been shed, but the appropriation of the blood waits for their faith to be kindled to understand and to appropriate and the recognition now of the being sinners of the provision made 2,000 years ago and now made demonstrable, visible before them through the suffering of the nation on its own road to Calvary. That's my prophetic view of the future that seems to tie in with all that I understand and all that has been given to me about the wilderness of the nations about Amos chapter 9, I will sift you through all nations. <coughs> all of the prophetic texts indicate a last day's apocalyptic devastation for the nation, an uprooting, a passing. And Jesus himself, great prophet, said in Matthew 24 and Luke 21, in answer to the questions of his disciples, tell us what are the signs of the end and of your coming? And in his reply, you can look it up yourself at your leisure, he gives a number of statements of what will characterize the end. Uh, upheavals in nature, devastations uh, uh, of, of a kind that we're now seeing with greater and greater frequency, and social unrest and upheavals in society, wars and rumors of war. Why, this, this 21st, 20th century is, is a, an age of unparalleled bloodshed and persecution of the church. And he says of the nation, there's coming a time of trouble such as never before has been, nor again ever will be. And if that time were not cut short, no flesh shall survive, no Jewish flesh, because it's the trouble of Israel. But for the elect's sake, that surviving remnant, if I can add to it, 
who will return to Zion with everlasting joy upon their heads. For their sake, that time will be cut short. Well, that, that computes, that figures, that, that there's a time of trouble greater than what the nation has previously known? You mean including the Nazi Holocaust? You mean it'll be greater than that which took six million Jewish lives? Yeah. How much greater? Well, when the Lord himself comes and his feet stand on the Mount of Olives, when all nations have come against Israel to destroy it, and Jerusalem has already been ravaged and its women raped wholesale, he finds that two-thirds have already perished and the one-third is brought through the fire. So if that's any kind of ratio for the devastation that falls on Jews everywhere, because it is the time of Jacob's trouble, wherever Jacob is, present Israel is Jacob, but Jacob is the name universally of a people who have not yet been made Israel. They don't yet worship at the altar of God. So two-thirds, let's say, roughly speaking, 15 million Jews in the world, 10 million will perish in three and a half years' time. I can't even imagine the logistics of this. It took the Nazis, the Germans, bless them, who have the scientific and mechanical ability to work out a program of annihilation. Who else could have done it with such efficiency as to cremate six million in a short period of time and right to the very last days of the war that the military historians to this day cannot understand how material and manpower would be mo moved toward the concentration camps and the death camps and away from the defense of Germany itself as if that were the greater priority which in Satan's sight it was. And why the Allies never bombed the, the, the tracks going into uh, Birkenau, Auschwitz. Why? Because when God says, I will hide my face from you, it means he will hide his face from you. He'll not allow his judgments to be shortened. They will have the full measure when the time has come. Why, why did the nations not receive Jews in flight from Europe? Uh, the famous uh, ship, the St. Louis, that had about close to a thousand Jews, men, women, and children, going from port to port, from New York to Havana to Latin America, not one would take them in. In the end, they had to return to Frankfurt and ended up in the gas chambers. God's judgments are remarkable and need to be seen as judgment if we are to receive the redemptive benefit because they are not punitive but redemptive. They're, they're God's provision for repentance, for an understanding of the question that should have been raised and is yet to be raised. What could have been, if this is judgment, we Jews, what could have been the magnitude of our sin that justified such devastation in such proportion? Because we think we're nice guys. Hey, listen, we've uh, discovered in the scientific discoveries and polio and I don't know what else we've done and uh, so many advantages to civilization. How could we have deserved that judgment? Of what sin were we capable and have performed that God had sought its recognition and repentance over the ages and we have not seen nor considered that required this. And if we'll not recognize this as judgment and there's yet a repentance that must come if we are to be restored to him in repentance, then what occasion is yet future that would succeed where the Nazi Holocaust did not? And that's what I believe is yet before us, the time of Jacob's trouble. And what will make it greater in the fulfillment of the word of Jesus, that this is the greater trouble that exceeds anything that the nation has previously known or will again know, is its magnitude. It will not be confined to Poland and to Germany, to Europe. It will be global. He will allow us to be pursued, harassed, and hunted down in all nations. Why will we be found in the wilderness of the nations? 
because there'll be no safety whatever in any urban center where the amenities of civilization are to be enjoyed. There we will be discovered. We have got to flee and find the most remote places. And you know what, it w what will astonish us? God has already prepared a passage, and it's called a highway of holiness. And the wilderness will be glad for us, and the trees will clap their hands, and nature will rejoice when they see our bedraggled kinsmen coming through, because it knows better than the church that this is the sign of the consummation, the, the last trial, the last suffering, the last sifting of Israel in order to be fitted for its millennial and eternal destiny and glory. Am I saying too much? Can you, can you absorb this? The fact that I'm saying it, I'm marveling. My mother, who had a major breakdown in the Second World War, because she had quite a few uh, Jewish friends in the Netherlands, and many of them committed suicide before not allowing themselves to be taken away. Yeah. And so when you say six million Jews in the concentration camp, mm -hmm. this would not include the ones who did this in that number and so there are actually very many more than those six million who mm -hmm. took their own lives yep. um, and I was just thinking that perhaps the same thing could happen again yep. yeah yeah I'm going to do it now <laughs> <laughs> no I told you you're not I told you yesterday so, you know, well, don't distract us, no. even um, by being informational. The, um, the, that with, with Jewish people fleeing and uh, seeking a safe haven, that there is more to it for us than just providing a, a shelter. Yeah. There has to be... Um, a security for them that would stop them from doing this same thing. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that the whole section of scripture that we're considering in which this great concluding saga is spoken begins with Isaiah 40. The, the first words of which are, comfort ye, comfort ye my people. The church has got to have a capacity to speak to its Jewish kinsmen and those who will pass through in a comforting way that does not mean making nice. It may, they may be hard words, they're true words, but it will bring a solace because my Jewish people are without any kind of big biblical understanding. For them, all they, all they can see is, here comes another onslaught, another devastation, Another anti-Semitism that has its origin in the New Testament where Jews are spoken of in so negative a way that it has spread the virus of anti-Semitism throughout the Christian world. They will look upon this Holocaust as another statement of the failure of Christendom. Mm -hmm. And they're coming to you who are Christians. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why talk about the Lord in the most implausible circumstances? And so they're going to come baited. They're angry. They're frustrated they've been stripped of everything their fortunes just as the, as the as the Jews were in Germany they were expelled from their professions from their apartments it came suddenly they could hear the the thump of the boots of the 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 Nazi henchmen coming up their stairs they knew their doom was sealed i've written something in an apartment in Germany in Berlin at the typewriter at the computer sitting in an apartment that i knew that i knew was once occupied by Jews. It was the former Jewish neighborhood, and that's where I was in those days. And I'm writing, and I'm very rarely creative and literary in this way, I'm writing as the Jew who's hearing the sound of the thump of heavy-booted steps coming up, and his mind is racing. What do I do now? My doom is sealed. I've got a few moments. What do I take? Uh, the memorabilia, the, my wife's photograph, 
the, the things that are dear, uh, and in the end he can take nothing. Who will go to her gravesite? Who will put a stone on her grave? You know how Jews do? The sign of their visit, they leave a stone on top of the tombstone. Who will visit her if I'm absent, if, if I'm taken? His mind is racing with all these thoughts, and before he can think them through, the doors burst open, and there are these uh, men with their swastikas and escorting him and taking him on his way to his own death. Whew. That's what we're going to see. Horror, brutality, suddenness, and men not even having time to understand. It'll come upon them suddenly. And that same Jewish man, for whom I paid a thousand dollars to attend his banquet. Oh, don't let me drift off into all of these little anecdotal stories, though they're rich. Imagine me giving a thousand dollar contribution to a secular cause in order to be invited to the banquet, given only to donors for the magazine commentary, the most dignified and significant Jewish publication in the world, which I cherish because my heart is out for its founder, Norman Podhoretz, who is exactly my age, exactly from Brooklyn, exactly in the army when I was in the army, exactly in Germany when I was in Germany, only his life has gone this way, my life has gone that way. I covet his soul. He's written a book on the prophets. He's a man who has a PhD in literature, English literature. He won a uh, scholar's award to go to Cambridge. And on top of that has attended the Jewish Theological Seminary. The guy's a brilliant, conservative mind, but totally outside of redemption. So I paid. I debated, Lord, should I, shouldn't I? I've never made a contribution to a secular cause. Thousand dollars is an ultimate measure. I did it, got the invitation. Someone sent me a check for $135 and I bought, I already had purchased and now this was the compensation, my Norman Podhoret suit. I've only worn it once at the banquet, but you should see me in it. <laughs> Mamma mia, distinguished pinstripe, beautiful cravat, and so I took Eileen Smith, my spinster lady friend from Staten Island, and we made quite a couple. And he, gre he greeted the guests at the door at this posh New York club where this banquet was being given. And when I gave him my name, he remembered that I had already sent him a little booklet on the prophetic call, the spirit of prophecy, forgetting that the very, on the very first page, page I'm quoting from Revelation, that the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. <laughs> Someone said, Art, you need to write exclusively for Jews. And so he saw me at uh, Katz. Oh, he said, I'm too old to be evangelized. I said, all the more reason. Pray for him. Why did I bring that up? Because that dear man, brilliant as he is, he has just won a national award for distinguished service as a civilian given him by President Bush, who reads his magazine and articles devoutly because the man is so brilliant and the magazine is so remarkably rich. And yet for all that, he doesn't have a fig of a notion of the time of Jacob's trouble. Can you imagine my frustration in New York? I should be shouting from the rooftops and warning a people of the devastation that is to come. I, I'm breaking my head to think how are those Lubavitcher uh, 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 Hasidim, these ultra-Orthodox Jews who celebrate Rabbi Menachem, what's his last name? Schneerson, who has died in nine, 1991, whose resurrection they're awaiting. How will they be saved out from New York City, from Brooklyn, when they are in the midst of a black ghetto? Why are they there? Because that was the cheapest place to find housing, that they could move into a neighborhood with a synagogue and walk to shul on Shabbat because you're not allowed to drive. How many of us are willing for such sacrifice? To give up our places in the country, our little dream houses, our privacy, to come into a black ghetto 
in order to be, have access to the center of our faith, the church, and be able to walk from our households to it on every Shabbat. That's, that's this people. I love them. I'm already mocked. I've already been kicked out of a Bible study. I've already been spurned by a family who had, ter- who had originally taken me in and told me how much they loved me and, and what a blessing it was until the authorities of their movement told them, don't extend hospitality to this man. He's a seducer. And he's persuaded that that magician, Jesus, is the Messiah, who learned his, his secrets from us in order to turn Jews away from the law and to himself. I am in an impossible situation, except for the grace of God. And it's more than just the, the ability to share with them the faith that they might be saved, but also to work out for them a route of flight and escape from that ghetto when the trap closes. And those black people around them who have never enjoyed their presence, and there has already been race riot when one of them hit a black kid in with his car and killed him, there were three days of rioting that only the mayor of New York City could quell, who at that time was a black man himself. So there's something right under the surface percolating, waiting to erupt, of anti-Jewish hatred by these black people. How will they be saved out of it? (coughs) What route will lead them out of Brooklyn and out of New York City and up through the northern uttermost regions and into New England and into Vermont and, and Maine and all those places through the wilderness of the Appalachian Mountains and into Canada. And then through Canada, down through the, the uh, porous border that you can walk across or, or swim even a boat across and come into where we are in Minnesota and the haven that God has been preparing there for 31 years. And then moved on from us to the places further south until they reached Mexico, which was the central staging area where when I went to Monterey, Mexico, people came up to me and said, long before you ever came out, the Lord had already told us that we ought to be a place where Jews will be assembled. And I was out in the wilderness outside of Monterey, sleeping out, and woke up in the morning and I looked out, it was Sinai. I had never seen such a desert area. In fact, to get there, our vehicle sank into the lake bed and uh, we couldn't go on, we had to be extricated and find another route to come to this place where this Mexican brother believed Jews will be assembled and it's a vast place. It's, whew, I don't think I've ever shared this publicly. How do you guys rate? But I'm just, I think the Lord wants you to know how real this is. This is not a figment of my imagination. That we have been for 31 years in the Arctic zone of North America in poverty, struggle to establish a place of refuge for Jews in flight. Not only coming out from Canada, but maybe going into Canada. It may be a two-way street, because I have so often said, the issue is not the shortest distance between two points. The issue is the maximum exposure to the highway of holiness, where Jews will meet Christians of every shape, size, and description, and race, and nationality, from the most urbane and sophisticated to the most elementary and primitive. Indians in the Sierra Madre Mountains will expect them. The black Africans in Kenyan, where I was that last time, that when we finally got to them, I thought, oh, Nairobi, praise God. I've been in the bush long enough. Now, real church, real city, capital city, and I'll really be able to unburden my soul and use the king's English. No, we went outside and up into the, the slum districts outside and we could hardly get there with a car. I never saw such pockholed streets where the car can fall all the way through and never be seen again. And finally we came into the little parking area and there was the building. It was a cargo container, or hardly more, metal, with rude benches, no electric, and the saints were appropriate to that setting. I don't think they ever got through elementary school. And I'm going to speak to them, the last day is eschatological and apocalyptic uh, vision of God for Jews to Africans in that condition. 
how can it succeed? Gloriously. They were transformed by the word. They rose to the occasion so that at the end I would say, if I, I think I've shared this already, whether it's five years, seven, ten, twelve, I can't tell you how long, there will be a time, be assured, that the same route by which I came to you, they will be coming to you. But when they come to you, they'll be astonished that they were expected and that you've prepared for them and that you welcome them and shower them with, with love and, and receive them. Because 5, 10, 12 years before, God had sent a Jewish messenger to prepare you. That's the drama that's taking place in these days. So comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Not, not with blandishment, not with telling them what nice guys they are, and this will pass shortly, but this is something through which you must pass. There's a redemptive drama here, more than you can presently understand. But as painful as it is, the end will be joy unspeakable and full of glory. Be brave. God will, is with you. As it says in Isaiah 35, the wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them. Isn't that an embarrassment to us? That dumb and inanimate nature will be glad for them, but we ourselves are not too glad. Why? Because if we are ever caught helping them, we're finished. What will be our fate if we are caught helping them? Jew lovers, not true New Zealanders and not true Americans, are not, you're not patriotic, you're joining the enemy. It's their fault that the world is in this condition. Their world conspiracy to take over finances and what has befallen them is appropriate. And you're helping them? Where's your loyalty to your country? And you're called call that Christians? The nature will be glad for them. But for us to be glad for them, knowing that it will be our peril, will require a remarkable stature, heroism, understanding, and heart that can only be the work of God's Spirit through His Word. In a word, we are really going to have to become saints. Sorry about that. <laughs> they compel us to sainthood. Isn't that remarkable? Even in their unbelief, and in their apostasy, and in their ruined and broken condition, is the provocation for us to rise to ultimate sainthood and sonship. For only on that basis can we be to them what we must. Isn't that a provision from God? And haven't they always played that role? Haven't they always tested the church? Haven't they always been the index of the truth of the church and found out and shown us to be phony? That, it, that the greatest men of the church have in the end proven to be anti-Semitic, Luther himself. The church, Germany that was modern Jewry's graveyard is the land of Luther. The test of the church has always been the Jew. Not when they're at their best, when they're at their worst. But nature is glad for them. We need to be also. Because when we see them in this condition, we know that the consummation of the ages is at hand. And even if we have to pay, with imprisonment, peril, or even our own execution, we, we obtain a martyr's crown. That we bear this not grimly like, why me, Lord, how come? But thank you, Lord, for the privilege of having anything to do with the passage of your people by which they enter Zion. For their coming is your coming. Once they enter, their king will come and rule from Zion the only appointed place. I'm grateful to have this actual privilege, even if it requires my life, to facilitate this conclusion of the age, for mine will be an eternal crown of glory. And so I'll bear this not grimly, but joyously. And when the Jews see us rejoicing for the prospect and not just bearing and gritting our teeth, waiting for the moment to pass so that our safety will not be threatened, They'll say, what in heaven's name is this? I've seen religion. I've seen men who are ethical, moral, and philosophical. 
but I have never seen this. There's no way to explain Gentiles like this except God. This is God. What they're exhibiting is God. And I didn't know that there was a God until I see it through them. I'm seeing in them the light that lightens the Gentiles, who is also the glory of the people of Israel. And that's exactly how I got saved 41 years ago. They'll see what I saw, where we le least expect to find it in the faces of the Goyim. There we expect to see sullen looks, critical, angry, prejudiced, but to see smiles and expansive love and acceptance as if we are kin, as if we're members of the same family. And we're rejoicing that we're aiding them to their destiny and their salvation and their call. That's why Jesus said, what you do for the least of these, my brethren, you do unto me. But if they are the least as his brethren, what are they to us? Strangers? This is deeper than blood, flesh and blood, that you should see in these Jews and in that condition your brethren. If they're his brethren, they're your brethren. And you need to treat them as such. This is more than can be expected of, of unaided man. Only the grace of God can bring us to such a condition because it can't be acted. We can't play at this. The Jews will see right through that as they always have. They, they have seen through the televangelists, the phoniness, more quickly than we. We're still supporting these creeps. And they, one flick of the TV, they see these men, phony. They see right through. We are seduced. They know. They know what's true. Leave it to Jews. I know them, especially New York Jews. Have an unfailing instinct for, the, for what is real and what is phony. We'll not be able to play at this. It'll have to be an authentic demonstration of very God. She said the young Israelis are just as perceptive who come to our country. Let's hope. Yeah. Okay. The wilderness, Isaiah 35, and the solitary place. So it's not going to be in the midst of the amenities of civilization. It will be solitary. It will be wild. Shall be glad for them. The desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. Imagine that nature itself experiences a, even a resurrection uh, effulgence just at the passing through of Jews in this condition. Where does it say that, Art? It's prophetic insight. It's interpretation. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it. The excellency of Carmel and Sharon doesn't mean that this is where it is. It could be in the wilderness of New, of New Zealand, Africa. It could be one in, in the remotest places of the world, and indeed it will be. They'll pass through the most remote places that they would never have chosen in a lifetime. But it will be their salvation. It will keep them from the place of terror. They will have to flee to such places. But to those places, as remote as they are, God will ascribe and impart the beauty of Sharon and Carmel. Nature will flourish just by their passing through because they've got to see even in nature the supernatural power of God to take a barren and threatening wilderness and to give it an aura of, of, of almost like a, a Garden of Eden evidence or else they would die before they're saved. These are people despairing, seeing, sensing utter hopelessness. Have you ever been lost in the wilderness? I don't care what university degrees you have or knowledge, when you don't know which way is north or south or east or west and whether you'll ever be found and the, what the, the prospect for survival is grim, it's terrifying. That's what they're going to experience. But they shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. If this is what it takes to see it, it's worth everything. And in fact, this is what it takes to see it. 
the excellency in the place where it's least expected, where if you don't see it, you're robbed of any hope of survival. Because those who perished in the Holocaust were not necessarily the physically weakest. Some of the physically weakest survived where the, those that were physically stronger perished for the want of hope. Hope is the ingredient for survival. But if they're bereft of hope, lost in a wilderness, not knowing which way is out, and are hungering and thirsting and phony, they see right through. We are seduced. They know. They know what's true. Leave it to Jews. I know them, especially New York Jews. Have an unfailing instinct for, the, for what is real and what is phony. We'll not be able to play at this. It'll have to be an authentic demonstration of very God. The wilderness, Isaiah 35, and the solitary place. So it's not going to be in the midst of the amenities of civilization. It will be solitary. It will be wild. Shall be glad for them. The desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. Imagine that nature itself experiences even a resurrection uh, effulgence just at the passing through of Jews in this condition. Where does it say that, Art? It's prophetic insight. It's interpretation. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it. The excellency of Carmel and Sharon doesn't mean that this is where it is. It could be in the wilderness of New, of New Zealand, Africa. It could be one in the, in the remotest places of the world, and indeed it will be. They'll pass through the most remote places that they would never have chosen in a lifetime. But it will be their salvation. It will keep them from the place of terror. They will have to flee to such places. But to those places, as remote as they are, God will ascribe and impart the beauty of Sharon and Carmel. Nature will flourish just by their passing through because they've got to see, even in nature, the supernatural power of God to take a barren and threatening wilderness and to give it an aura of, of, of almost like a, a Garden of Eden evidence or else they would die before they're saved. These are people despairing, seeing, sensing utter hopelessness. Have you ever been lost in the wilderness? Whew. I don't care what university degrees you have or knowledge. When you don't know which way is north or south or east or west and whether you'll ever be found and the, what, the, the prospect for survival is grim, it's terrifying. That's what they're going to experience. But they shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. If this is what it takes to see it, it's worth everything. And in fact, this is what it takes to see it. The excellency in the place where it's least expected. Where if you don't see it, you're robbed of any hope of survival. Because those who perished in the Holocaust were not necessarily the physically weakest. Some of the physically weakest survived where the, those that were physically stronger perished for the want of hope. Hope is the ingredient for survival. But if they're bereft of hope, lost in a wilderness, not knowing which way is out, and are hungering and thirsting and they're feeling the heat, as I have, as I have been treated to segments of the journey on the route of escape in Mexico, taken in with a four-wheel vehicle, where I saw a cactus 20, 25 feet high in blistering sun, there's not a drop of water. I, I despaired that we would come out in a four-wheel vehicle. How will they come out on foot who, who are out of shape to begin with, sitting in their offices and their penthouse apartments, are now out in a rugged wilderness having to trudge with, in the heat of day without protection, already banged up and bruised and wounded in, in a hopeless environment in which they can't find a way out. They'll perish for the want of hope except there be somebody there with them who can speak a word of comfort, of encouragement that is more than just some mealy-mouthed human pat on the back. And that's what we see here. God now is speaking in verse 3, not to Israel, 
but to someone with them in the remote wilderness place and saying, strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Can you see that? You, you guys are sufficiently exegetical to see someone is being addressed who is not himself weak, that they should say something to those who are and that their saying will establish strength, will establish hope. Because the word that God wants them to speak is not some human well-wishing sentiment that will fall to the ground, but is a prophetic word. Because the prophetic word is itself an event. The prophetic word causes to be the thing that it speaks. But where are such a people to be found who have this prophetic ability corporately and will be in that remote wilderness place? God had better start recruiting and getting such a people ready. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong. You know, when you say prophetically to a fearful heart, be strong, you know what happens? They become strong. When Jesus says, be not afraid, he's not just giving a suggestion, he's giving a command. And when you receive that in his authority, fear dissipates. Be not afraid. I'm commanding, I'm giving you a statement that cancels out every reason for fear. My word is greater than the circumstance. Wouldn't it be wonderful if he were there to speak it? Well, he will be if Christ is in you and that your speaking is his. But how do you get from where you presently are, speaking only sentimental human things, to the place where you speak prophetic and divine things in that authority, compassion, and love that constitutes an event for those who hear it? Something has got to happen between now and then that will not be a moment's magic when we need it. It will be the result of the investment of God and his preparation in us to bring us to that place, not only individually but corporately. For if we are not there, in that reality, in that strength, in that speaking, they will perish in hopelessness and despair before the Lord's appearing. Say to them, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. He'll come with a vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Well, two people can say exactly the same thing, and in the one, the word falls flat, and in the other, the person rises with hope. The word has become a vent. They know that God will come, though they don't know God, but they'll believe such a prophetic word, for that word is redolent with faith and with true conviction. It's a tested word through a tested vessel. How shall we speak like that? Only if God has come to us in our wilderness. The prophet must speak out of his experience. That's the difference between a prophet and a teacher. The teacher can just speak from the text and exposit, and we receive benefit and blessing. But the prophetic word to be an event has got to be tested and made real in the prophet's own experience. He has got to marry a whore. He's got to know what infidelity and rejection means as God's own experience with Israel. He has got to live in the wilderness. He has got to be rejected. So that when his word comes, it's a tested word, for the prophet is the thing in himself. He's the word made flesh. His word is not just an articulation. It's an event. But what it cost to form such a man is itself the cross. So isn't it interesting that Ben Israel in northern Minnesota, after 10 years of struggle in 30 below zero Fahrenheit winters, week after week, where we plugged the car in so that it would be heated, so that this pregnant woman, if she needed medical attention when she gave birth, we could get her to a hospital, only to find out in the emergency of her birth where she was hemorrhaging that the engine started, but the transmission was frozen stiff and could not be shifted. That's what we lived in. 
And after 10 years of struggle, just being with God's people, my God, day after day, and all of the crisis and all the rebellion and all the hooting and hollering and, and indictment and shame and, and your wife, who never did believe it was God's call because she didn't tell her. She never got the vision and had to give up her beautiful 17-room house in New Jersey with nine bedrooms and five baths, it's the Gothic masterpiece, to live out in the boondocks, this fair-haired Scandinavian where every mosquito was sure to find her, every tick and every bug. <laughs> and someone uh, will borrow her pots and pans and not bring them back or bring them back dented or traffic mud into the house and, and, uh, le and quite vocal to let everyone know that uh, she's totally opposed to the entire enterprise. So on top of struggling it out with the saints, you've got your own wife. Not in sympathetic encouragement, but in clear and vocal opposition, shouting from the rooftops against you and against the whole enterprise for 10 years. Only now, after 30 years, is she beginning to make peace with it. It took that length of time. <laughs> But we had to suffer all of that indignity, all of that humiliation, all of that opposition. And just when we began to see daylight after 10 years, guess what God did? He brought it to a close. Shut it down. Vacate the property. Leave it to the, to the, uh, to the elements and those who will despoil it without any thought of return or when there'll be return or if there'll be return. And all that without explanation. Wouldn't explanation have been helpful? No. If you don't leave, he said to one of the elders, I'll kill you. He was earnest about this. And this one elder did not believe my prophetic interpretation that God wanted the whole property and the community ministry brought into death. That we had to be expelled. We had to experience expulsion and flight. You know, he wanted to stay. He always wanted a rustic location. And so he was living in my house. I had left. And we had one final meeting. Though we had several meetings before in which I pleaded. I said, God wants this whole place shut down. We must vacate. No, he said, I don't see that. And this was a man who, there, who said he was there for my prophetic ministry. It's wonderful how people will receive your prophetic ministry until it gores them. And so I, I despaired. I said, okay, Lord. We went to bed that night. The next morning was departure. And this man came to the breakfast table white as a sheet. I said, what happened to you? Oh, he said, I prayed before going to bed. Lord, if I'm wrong, because he didn't expect to be. As a man of principle, you show me. And the Lord said, if you'll not leave, I'll kill you. He left. God was serious. There's something that we had to experience or we will not have a valid word for our kinsmen or for the church. We've got to know expulsion and we're, now we're coming to know return. Judgment and restoration or else our word will not be a true word. It has got to issue from some measure of experience appropriate to the thought of God. How shall you say to the, to the Jews in the wilderness, in the deeps of their despair, your God will come. He will recompense you unless you know that God in exactly that way. That means you've got to open your New Zealand life to the danger of real faith and propheticness. You have to let go of the God that you have been so long cultivating to keep you in safety and open yourself for distress, for trial, where if God does not come, you're finished. He's got to come to you in recompense, in seeming hopelessness, that when you later say to them, your word will be more than just well-meaning intention. It will be a living word, a prophetic word, that when they hear that, you know what it says in the text? The eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. What a word. 
my God, I wish I had that capacity now. Then shall the lame man leap as the hot, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert, and the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water in the habitation of dragons, where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. Whew, what a text. A prophetic text. Millennia in advance of the actuality that is yet future and must be fulfilled. And the key is not the Jew. The Jew is nigh unto death. He's despairing. Norman Port Haritz, for all of his brilliance, is at the end of his wit. And his 77-year-old Lex can hardly sustain him. He's ready to cash in in despair except he hears a word. Your God will come. He will recompense you. And when he hears that word, his historically blind eyes are opened. His mouth is able to speak. His legs become strong. What a word that even nature hears it and the water breaks forth out of dry ground for they had not drink. Yes, this is poetic. The prophets always are. Yes, it's symbolic, but it's also actual. It's also literal. But the key is not the Jew. The key is that someone to whom God says, say to them. You say to them. Because if you don't, if you don't say to them, they'll die in despair and hopelessness. What they need now is a word. Before the appearing of God. To believe for that appearing when there's no hope for it visibly or physically. You say to them. May our whole Christian life and all of its experience be the preparation for that speaking. What an enterprise, what a remarkable thing that in the last analysis, the issue of God's success with this people, for how does the chapter end? The ransomed of the Lord shall return. No ifs, ands, or buts. They're going to make it through. A surviving remnant who will constitute a restored nation and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy, not manufacture or produce it, and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Not only the sorrow of what they have lost, their nation, the state, their possessions, and yet a joy and gladness shall be upon their heads in an everlasting way, not only because they shall not again have to experience this kind of distress, but they shall be extolled and be made very high and given a place in the nations above all nations.